Bonjour. Yeah, you can hear me? Yes. Warm oceanic greetings. Welcome to the people who were not with us last night for the official welcome. You missed a wonderful event. Uh, thanks again to our University of New Caledonia colleagues, um, especially the colleagues from NERA, Yolande, Fabrice, Stefan. Uh, just before we get moving on the program, we have a few uh, little changes to announce. They will be posted on each of the doors of the rooms that we're being used. But just so you're aware, um, four people have pulled out since we put the program together. Anthony Welch had to leave at one o'clock this morning on the, on the plane. Um, Yasuo Uchido cannot come, neither can Unaisi Namombo Bamba, who we dearly miss. Shane Duggan, Zihan Lo. None of them are now on the program. We've replaced Unaisi with Rachel Tarombi. We're really glad that you are presenting for us, Rachel, and the title of her talk, will, her paper, will be up on this paper on the door. Very interesting one about um, sustainable development goal four and girls with disabilities in Papua New Guinea. Um, I've asked two respected and, and valued colleagues if they would mind shifting into another session so that we can equalise the numbers presenting, so that we have more sessions with three speakers than four. So thanks to Carol Much, who was in 1.1, and Nigel Bagnall, who was with 4.1. They are now in 2.1 with Dean Ola. Okay? Disparate topics, I haven't been able to connect them thematically as we tried in, in most sessions, but we really appreciate those people's willingness to, um, to move. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Yolanda and our first keynote speaker, who Yolanda will introduce to you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Good morning um, for this first um, day of the conference here. Um, so let me introduce you to Professor Konai Helu Feynman. Um, she's been, she's been, um, um, she taught in high schools in Tonga um, during her earlier professional years. And um, she's been on the staff at the University of the South Pacific for 17 years, where she's held a number of um, um, management positions. She um, currently, she's currently Professor of Education and Culture at USP, and she sits in the Joint um, International Labor Organization, UNESCO Committee, which works on the application um, and recommendations of the, um, on the status of teachers. She's also a fellow of the Asia Pacific Center uh, for Educational Innovation and Development. Her research work um, has put light on a number of different fields such as teacher education, indigenous education, women and university management, um, Pacific research frameworks, and education for sustainable development. Today, um, Professor Konai will introduce, will present us um, the notion of sustainable development in a Pacific perspective on education. Um, but before I end up my introduction, I would like to point out that um, our keynote speaker also writes beautiful poetry, um, and it is uh, studied in schools all throughout Pacific region. So let's welcome Professor Konai, thank you. Is it working? Can you hear me? <laughs> Bonjour, Maloy Lele, Talofalam, Kia ora, Kia orana. 
and all those lovely greetings from Oceania and hello. Thank you very much for that introduction. I would like to acknowledge a few people before I start. First of all, the people of this land where we are privileged to hold our uh, conference. Secondly, to the conference organizers for inviting me so I can bore you to death, saying things that I have already said before many times, but nobody listened, so hopefully some of you would listen this time. Thirdly, to acknowledge some of you who have played a major role in my own sustainable education. Um, I can see many of you here today, the Teasdales, Eve, Christine, and many others, um, that over the years I had learned a lot from you, um, and hopefully um, my students too would have learned from me because I have learned from you. And finally, I'd like to apologize to you. First, if I say things that um, don't agree with your worldview or your discipline, um, or I say things that you already knew and feel that you're wasting your time sitting there. But I come from Tonga, where we have lots and lots of rules governing speaking, talking, sitting, going, everywhere, everything had rules. So if you break those rules, there are sanctions. And so in Tonga, this is very typical of when people speak, they apologize just in case they, <laughs> they offend. Sustainable development, like climate change, has become the new sexy topic, as you know. Even in the university where I work, <clears throat> it is there in, in your face when you open the USB website. Excellence and sustainable development in higher education. I'm not quite sure what these means, <laughs> these words mean, but I do know that about a third of our recurrent budget from our, at our university and in many of the Pacific Island countries comes from development aid, mainly from Australia and New Zealand. And for that, we are very thankful. We also assume that most people who live in the 12 member countries of our university have the same notion, or the same ideas about sustainable development that we do at the university whatever that may happen to be. However, my experiences in talking, teaching about, and doing things related to education for sustainable development have not been as, straight, as straightforward and as easy as some of our leaders think or expect. In this presentation, I problematize the notion of education for sustainable development by first providing a brief background of what ESD means to the international community through the discussion of the UN Decade of Education for Sustainable Development, 2004 to 2014, before giving you some examples of Pacific, Pacific notions of sustainable development, particularly their implications for many of us in terms of teaching and research. That's basically what I hope to do. I want to share some assumptions with you in case you hear something that may not make sense, because I make all kinds of assumptions when I talk. One, that there is no single view of reality, including sustainable development. That knowledge is time and content context specific and is socially constructed. That indigenous and traditional knowledge ensures rigor, validity, and reliability in the discourse of sustainable development for Pacific Island countries. And finally, that in the indigenous worldviews provide alternative epistemological places and spaces for negotiation, sustainable development, especially for indigenous peoples. The UN decade um, of sustainable development 
came and went. Many of us didn't even realize there was a decade. My involvement in ESD began in 2005 when I was invited to join a group of people from the Asia Pacific region in Bangkok to draft the ESD framework for the region. That's the Asia Pacific region. Later, I was invited again to join a group of, quote, experts in Apia to draft the Pacific framework for ESD. I have also been teaching about education for sustainable development for many years and was a member of the UNESCO Global Committee for Monitoring and Evaluation the Decade. I'm giving you this information not to impress you that I've been involved in ESD for so long, but to impress you that ESD, as far as I'm concerned, had failed the Pacific region. But don't tell UNESCO that. In 2010, as part of the USP's contribution to ESD, and in association with the UN University in Tokyo, three books were published on ESD. The first was edited by Nambombombamba, um, Dr. Una, who unfortunately is not here today. And if you get this book, it is about different notions of sustainable development from around the Pacific. So you can leave now if you have that book or you're going to buy it because then you can, don't have to listen to me to uh, tell you about Pacific notions of sustainable development. It's a nice little book and I use that as a text in my, my course on education for sustainable development. There was a world conference um, to celebrate the end of the decade that was held in Japan, and I think Dr. Anna, who is here today, attended that conference. <clears throat> At the end of the conference, the participants agreed on various outcomes of the decade. There's too many to list here, but I want to share with you one which I um, was very interested in, and it's adoption of a contextualized approach as a critical factor to success in ESD. And in my short experience of teaching at USB for over 40 years, this is a major problem in education in the Pacific. Our failure, meaning myself and other educators, to properly contextualize things that emanate from other places and other spaces. The success stories from the Asia Pacific region were mainly, this is what they found in Nagoya, were mainly related to the environment dimension of ESD. The other pillars, society and economy, were there, but there were not too many success stories from our region. There were many challenges too that were discussed at this conference. I want to share with you just a few because they're relevant to my talk. One, the need to promote a comprehensive understanding and consensus around the nature of sustainable development. Two, developing a clear generic definition of education for sustainable development. Three, conceptualizing a link between peace, sustainable development, and international understanding. And this is, of course, um, an area that your organization would be very interested in. And fourth, gaining a better balance among the various dimensions of ESD. Another challenge faced by those working in ESD-related areas was in relation to the difficulty of finding appropriate indicators for sustainable development. This is a era of indicators. You have to have indicators to show people that you have succeeded or not succeeded. In terms of ESD, Education for Sustainable Development, the indicators they discussed included 
things like the percentage of curriculum subjects that related to ESD, the percentage of teachers who speak the same language as their students. <laughs> and this is very tricky in the Pacific where we have thousands of different languages and cultures. Another one was the percentage of government budget devoted for ESD. And finally, the development of appropriate monitoring and evaluation framework, such as, for example, the HOPE framework developed by a group of people who attended an ESD conference in Japan, and the Teasdales are here, and where's Jenny? Jenny wrote up um, the proceedings for that conference, and we came up with the HOPE framework, holistic ownership, participation, and what was E? Um, empowering. This was a holistic framework of, about looking at ESD that I rather like um, because a lot of that reflected what many Pacific people regard as sustainable development. So I've spent a bit of time um, talking about the decade because for me, it was a pity that DSD, like many global instruments, came and went without many people knowing about it, even doing anything about it. But the UN is, um, they like to have the year of this and a decade of that and a day of this and a day of that. And nowadays, just about every week or every month or every year, we celebrate something. and. Um, and it is unfortunate that some of us in education are not doing enough to contextualize these things um, for Pacific learners. Okay, I'm skipping some things because we are starting late. Um, okay, but what, one of the positive aspects of the decade in my view was this. The three pillars of ESD, as I mentioned earlier, were environment, economy, and society. But UNESCO suggested that underpinning those pillars was culture. And that uh, made me feel very happy because finally um, UNESCO and others real, um, recognized the importance of cultural context to any development um, for that matter. For me, culture is, is how I look at culture, a way of life of a people, which includes their knowledge and value systems passed on through generations in context-specific learning systems using their own languages. For most of the indigenous populations of Oceania, especially those who still live in their ancestral homes, culture is lived, not debated in conferences. It provides the context for what they do, who they are, what they know and believe in, how they live their lives, and what preoccupies their thinking on a daily basis. This prompted me to pen this little poem called Thinking. You say that you think Therefore, you are. But thinking belongs in the depths of the earth. We simply borrow what we need to know. These islands, the sky, the surrounding seas, the trees, the birds, and all that are free, the misty rain, the searching river, pools by the blowholes, a hidden flower, have their own thinking. So today I'd like to share with you perspectives that have influenced the processes that may sound familiar to some of you, particularly those of you whose mother tongue is indigenous to our region and who are socialized like me within a particular cultural history and context, but later exposed to mainly Anglo-American and European cultures through learning their languages and attending their educational institutions. 
In our conversation about ESD, we remember the context in which education and development take place in Oceania, the people and their cultures. So for me, in order for development to be sustainable for Pacific people, it has to be culturally inclusive for all. I know this is a huge ask in a region where education and development have been totally dominated by foreign cultures, their languages, knowledge systems, communication networks, and research paradigms for over a century now. However, I will obey the conference organizers and start this conversation about sustainable development, especially educating for sustainable development. So what is so problematic about ESD? And what is the future of SDGs in the Pacific? As you know, there are 17 SDG, SDG goals. There were eight Millennium Development Goals. None of those eight um, really went anywhere very much in our region. So now we have 17, so good luck to us. For many years, the development community viewed our region as the Pacific Island region is underdeveloped and we work to improve our lot by educating ourselves in the ways of the West. The process of improving has resulted in various dimensions um, of cultural transformation and reorienting ourselves and our cultures to fit a predominantly Western scientific and industrial worldview. Examples of, sorry, examples of ensuring that this was done included the banning of different aspects of indigenous religious practices, the introduction of schools, and the requirement for teaching and learning in a foreign language. So today, our formal education, with very few exceptions, continues to be culturally undemocratic from early childhood right up to university. Um, Okay. And the success, our success in this formal education system is seen by many people as the best indicator of the colonization of the indigenous mind. So I am standing in front of you with all the Western education that I have gone through. I am a living example of the colonization of the indigenous mind. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here, wouldn't have been invited. So, in this regard, I am reminded of Fanon and Nandi's, uh, or is it Nandi's claim, that imperialism and colonialism brought complete disorder to colonized people, disconnecting them from their histories, landscapes, languages, social relations and their way of thinking, feeling, and interacting with the world. When you think about it, it is a major transformation. And some of us have learned to live with it. And when you start reflecting on what could have been or what can be to make things easier for those of us from the Pacific who were not lucky enough or unlucky enough to have had this long process of socialization into Western thoughts and philosophies. It struck me as a very, uh, not only um, difficult thing to ref go back and reflect, because it's, we have been tied to one another. That's how I think about it. We have been tied to each other, to one another in a way that some of us may not be able to do this critical reflection on our own education. Today your words are empty, sucking dry the brown dust left by earth and sky. Patches politely parched with no water flowing from the mountain top. Scars burn on my soft skin. You have cut a piece of me away. 
leaving my bandaged heart to endure the pain of your tying me to yourself. But I digress, sorry. Sorry, as you know, the global development agenda emphasizes education for all and the expansion of market-driven products with its emphasis of, on science and new ICTs and mostly framed and dominated by Western-derived ideas, concepts, and practices. Today, many of us are being asked by foreign develop, um, development partners, as well as our own government officials and our own higher education managers, who are responsible for development and strategic plans that largely mimic those of the development partners, to comply with their plans because this is what is required for excellence and sustainable development. This process, largely expert driven, and I was one of those experts, materialistic and culturally ahistorical, continues with the only thing that is specific about most of our projects is the term Pacific in the title. The, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having problems because they printed my talk on both sides. Mm. Okay. The separation <clears throat> of education from sustainable development is also inherent in the ESD literature. So what we have found in many Pacific contexts is that learning and living are two sides of the same sustainable development agenda. The embeddedness of learning and sustainable development is illustrated by the Tongan conception of sustainable livelihood. Sustainable livelihood in education project was a research project conducted by some of my colleagues in Tonga where they discovered that sustainable development was mo'ui pakapotopoto, living the wise life, a wise and sustainable life. Mo'ui is a way of living. No, mo'ui is life itself. And poto is the basic Tongan, a basic concept of education, of Tongan education. The end result of learning, or as Kavaliku describes it, the positive application of knowledge. Poto privileges learning, understanding, and behaving in a culturally appropriate manner. In other words, knowing what to do and doing it well. Such learning is not confined to formal education, but occurs in different epistemological sites within indigenous communities and reflected, as reflected in all aspects of community life, including their heritage arts, as described by Koya Vakauta in her groundbreaking work on tapa and tatau. It is obvious to me that the current discourse on education for sustainable development needs, in, in, in this ESD, we need to obtain a better and fuller understanding of what ESD means to Pacific Island people and how education may improve their approach by facilitating and reorienting the education that we provide, to we provide them. Other perspectives, as I have mentioned earlier, is contained in this book, um, perspectives from other parts of the Pacific, which I wanted to skip but let me just say a few, give you a few examples. In Fiji, for example, <clears throat> um, education for sustainable development is about the continuity and survival of the Vanua. Vanua is um, all embracing concept which has been wrongly translated to land, but Vanua is more than land, it's like Fenua, or Fonua, and many of you here would understand what I am talking about. Similarly, in other parts of the Pacific, this is 
um, their conception. But I want to speak briefly about the importance of Pacific pedagogies and then talk about Pacific research as two approaches of ensuring a better result, if you like, in terms of educating for sustainable development. Many of you are already familiar <coughs> with examples of Pacific pedagogies. And some of us who are teachers at schools or university know about these ways of teaching and ways of learning. Those of us who grew up in Pacific Island communities experience these types of learning. But when we went to school, we found that different types of um, methods were used by our teachers. And some of us were lucky to get through, but the majority of us um, in the Pacific drop out. Not because um, uh, kids drop out now from school, not because they are dumb or unable to learn, as some teachers see, but it's because I think the teaching, the teachers are not using the appropriate uh, methods of teaching and or the curriculum is totally foreign to them. Now, some of these um, pedagogy, some of these methods, I want to just remind you of. These have been very useful for me in my work in ESD, and I encourage my students to use the same. These include <coughs> different types of learning. These include learning through observation and imitation of those who have learned. The Tongan term for fayako is a person who is doing the learning or a person who has done the learning. So a teacher in the Tongan sense must practice what she preaches, must demonstrate the kind of outcomes that she would like to see the students achieve. Unfortunately, this is not necessarily the case. But learning through observation and imitation, learning through um, trial and feedback, doing things over and over again. Uh, one of my colleagues told me that the, the students, would, there was too much repetition in the class. The teacher was repeating too many things. And I thought, that's how I learn, through listening, repeating and repeating. Uh, it's rote learning. It's terrible. No, but if you learn to dance, you have to learn to dance so many times. And until it's the movement is perfect, and then you're allowed to perform in public. So learning trial and feedback is very important. Learning in groups. Of course, some people don't learn in groups. They prefer to learn individually. But for me, these are some of the things that have worked in my classes. Um, learning by doing, and people who take their students on field trips and get them to actually do things know what that is. There's a whole lot of lists. There's a list here which you will be able to get from my uh, PowerPoint, uh, not PowerPoint, from my um, paper, which you can have later. Learning that is contextualized and spontaneous. Uh, learning through real life situations. Learning that is focused on mastery of specific context. Learning from, by watching adults. Uh, we learned a lot by just following our parents and grandparents everywhere. Okay. They didn't say, okay, um, at the end of this trip, you will have this, this, and this information and be able to practice this skill, which is as teachers, that's what we write down in our lesson plan. No, we just followed them around. We watched them. You go to a funeral. You know exactly what to do when you grow up because you notice that today you're taking a pig and some yams, and then some other days you're not taking anything. You, your aunt is sitting inside being the, the chief. Different contexts, different types of learning. But in Tonga, according to the SLEP project, which um, the, our Institute of Education conducted there, they found that Tongans learn mainly through observation, sio, touching and practice, ala, and listening, fanongo, sorry, ta, and demonstration. These were the four outcomes of learning to be fakapotopoto, excuse the word, but that is our word, a sustainable 
livelihoods. Unfortunately, listening nowadays is not really, um, people listen, well, I guess they listen, but they don't get much, like you are doing now. Um, in Solomon Islands, the main learning strategies, or so my students tell me, include observation and imitation, participation in adult activities, as you know, the following around that I was talking about, listening and remembering, as well as verbal instruction about important things um, in life, such as work and cultural values. So for me, it's obvious that when we talk about learning for sustainable living, we need to recognize the importance of understanding that both education and sustainability are notions that are embedded in people's cultures and reflected in their methods as well as their uh, methods of teaching as well as their learning styles. But in all the meetings I have attended everywhere on ESD, education is separated from sustainable development. And I think this was one of the reasons why our little region didn't get very far with the goals and targets of ESD. But I'd like now, before I finish, to move on to research, because people are, will be saying, OK, so we want, you want to use specific pedagogies, you want to use traditional knowledge of specific societies, but we have no information on those. Where are we going to get the information? Well, through research but not any kind of research, a particular, particular approach to research. And it's called, we call it in our little part of, of the Pacific, Pacific research. It's not research about the Pacific. It's research for the Pacific by the Pacific. So Pacific research for us is defined as research that is informed by and embedded within Pacific knowledge systems. It involves the active participation of Pacific peoples and communities and is relevant and responsive to their needs. The values that underpin Pacific research are values that are cross-cutting around the Pacific, such as respect, relationships, competence, utility, active engagement, reciprocity, collective as well as individual rights, capacity building and participation. Ethical behavior is so important in Pacific research, but it's culture specific and expressed verbally as well as non-verbally in the language of the culture, such as the ceremonies, attire and other products. So when we sign off the university's ethics form to go and conduct research in a place in Solomon Islands or in Tonga or in Vanuatu, that doesn't mean that you can now go and conduct your research. There are other protocols and research forms that you have to look at before you can conduct your research in many Pacific communities. Advocates of Pacific research say that this is the most useful one way of gauging Pacific people's views on sustainable development. And I recall Tuhiwai Smith describing this type of approach to research as a very important part of the decolonizing agenda. Solomon Island academic David Gagel says that Pacific research is a way of addressing the epistemological silencing, I kind of like those two words, epistemological silencing, um, and sometimes, well, of our people in their own spaces. While the Hawaiian academic Manu Maya says, Pacific research is a good way of addressing the question of what is worth knowing in our communities. The director of the USP Institute of Education, Johansson Fua, says that Pacific research provides an authentic contribution to knowledge production, especially in relation to sustainable development. And if you think about it, it is important that we make an authentic contribution 
to global knowledge, to global research. Okay? When I go to UNESCO meetings, they don't ask me, what do Australians think about this? Or what do New Zealanders think about that? They ask me, what do Tongans think about that? Okay? So we have to make an authentic contribution and not just mimic what other people are doing. Surely we can do that. So for me, Pacific research, you don't have to come up with a justification for it. Oh yeah, okay, it's a good and authentic contribution. Yes, it's good for, for the decolonizing agenda. But for me, Pacific research is good in itself. And it is fun. For me, that's a good enough excuse. So, in the last couple of decades, there, uh, there have been Pacific Islanders who have worked um, hard, including their supervisors, to develop what we now refer to as research frameworks, Pacific research frameworks. There are quite a few. Some people think there are too many. But I think it's, it's a great way for Pacific Islanders to theorize their education to theorize their research approaches. Some of these um, frameworks that are listed in my paper, um, and there are only about half that I have listed here, they are now being critiqued by students from the same um, communities that these people came from. For example, Nambombombamba Vanua framework has been critiqued by two of my Fijian um, PhD students, and they have come up with an adaptation of the Vanua framework. The Kakala framework, which is probably the oldest one, and I am the oldest in, <laughs> probably here, no, almost, maybe third or fourth oldest. The Kakala uh, framework, which um, has been associated with my name, had been critiqued by two of my colleagues, one of whom is here, Dr. Anna, and we need to do that. We need to not only theorize, develop our own frameworks, we need to critique it, particularly uh, if we want it to be more robust and more relevant. So the Kakala framework, um, there, are, there is the Tivaivai, that's a, uh, a Cook Island framework. There is the Fa'afalitui, it's a Samoan fa uh, framework. There are lots of Samoan, other Samoan frameworks, um, and also lots of Tongan frameworks. The, the um, Maya also created a framework for Hawaiian. So they're all in the, in the paper that you can read about. But I want to end by just briefly sharing with you um, the Kakala framework, which also is in the paper, and you can read the details. But because we are short of time, I will just briefly talk about the Kakala framework. Kakala it's a generic term in Tonga that means all fragrant flowers and parts of plants that are used to make a garland. So in Tonga, that is a kakala is a garland, the physically a garland, which you wear either around your neck or around your waist. It's like the lei or the hay or the salu salu. Now this, um, the reference to kakala, the metaphor of kakala is interesting because I used that with my students and they understood what I was talking about because they could all relate to the making, the processes in the making of a garland. So there were originally three uh, main processes. Tolly, which is the picking, the gathering of the materials, the flowers. There's a whole protocol related to that. Depending on what kind of garland you're making, who you're making it for, are you making it for a dancer, or is it for a chief guest? So this determines, ideally, the types of materials. So you gather your flowers and then you make the garland. Now that's another process and there are protocols related to that. Protocols related to the ranking of the flowers. Don't forget, I'm from Tonga where we rank everything and everybody. So there are chiefly flowers and there are not so chiefly flowers. So when you make a garland, you put the chiefly flowers, the heilala, for example, lovely fragrance on top, 
and then you put the other things underneath. But they are still important because the whole kakala is the one that matters. So you make a garland and then you gift the garland to somebody. And underpinned by the two very important Tongan values of Fakap Appa, respect and offer compassion or love. Okay? Because in Tonga, a kakala has to be gifted, it has to be given away. You don't kind of sit down and make your own kakala and walk around with it. You make it, so you gift it. And then when you get it, you're supposed to gift it to somebody else. Now, those processes are related to research, different aspects of research, including the writing up and giving the report to your supervisor or to those people who fund your research, which is also explained in the paper. Um, later, this Kakala framework was enhanced by two of my colleagues, Dr. Johansen Fua, I mentioned earlier, who, used, who was responsible for the SLED project in Tonga, and Dr. Anna. And they suggested that there was a, a first step before the tolly, and that is the teu, and teu means preparing, the preparation for the research. Okay, and they also suggested that at the end, after you make the kakala, you need another step, which is called mali and mafana. There are two of um, two notions, but related to each other for monitoring and evaluating the research. So now the kakala research framework, teu, toli, Tui, Luva, and Mali and Mafan. Those two concepts were taken from another colleague's work at the University of Auckland, uh, Linda Manuatu, when she spoke about the success of teaching is me measured by the interaction between the teacher and the student and resulting in Mali and Mafana. Mali and Mafana are concepts borrowed from Tongan dance where the dancer has to be skillful in the dance, but can connect emotionally with the audience so that the audience will feel good. They will feel warm. Mafana means warm in Tongan. And when you feel warm, you connect with the dancer. And in modern days, you get up and you put $100 on her hair because you have that, that link. So the relevance of the Kakala metaphor to research, it may be understood, therefore, by reference to the, the three main processes that I have described. The Kakala framework was used by um, Johansen Fua and her colleagues in the Sustainable Development Project in Tonga. And the, there are details about that project that are, are listed in my paper. Um, but I, I want to share with you what Dr. Fua said about that project and the lessons that those of us who conduct research in the Pacific Islands could learn from this particular project. She said there were, these were the lessons she thought were useful the easy conceptualization of the project. The participants that they worked with were familiar with kakala. Kakala um, as a metaphor and kakala as a research approach. The purpose was made clear to the people. Participants were called participants, not research subjects. The people that they research, um, worked with were participants of the research. The data they collected concurred generally with existing knowledge systems of Tonga. The participants were transformed, particularly the ones from the teachers' college, the teacher trainees were part of this project. And they came to like research, but before the project, they feared it. They didn't want to do it. They 
they thought it was so difficult to do. There were multiple beneficiaries, for example, those working in the curriculum uh, department could use the, the, um, the results in terms of reorienting the curriculum towards ESD. Teacher educators also benefited, uh, and the researchers benefited as well, because they went, they used the Tongan, two Tongan approaches to research, the Talanoa and the Nofo. So some of the students themselves and the, and the researchers did not know about this. So in the re research process, they came to know about their own um, methods of gathering information. So, I think Pacific Research, and I, I would like to advocate for more people, particularly Pacific Islanders, using this approach to try and identify how Pacific Islanders see sustainable development. What is sustainable development? How can we, quote, measure the success of developing activities towards SDGs, and you know, that's a huge, um, a huge challenge. But we still face a lot of problems trying to do Pacific research. Some include the lack of institutional support. When I give my talks on Pacific research, I would like to see more institutional support. My own institution, so far, um, I don't know whether they don't know about it or they know about it, but they don't want to um, put money in it. But there is a lack of overt institutional support. When you talk to individual managers, they say, oh, that's a very good research approach. But um, it, it's not, it doesn't feature in many of our research documents. There is still the epistemological silencing of our people when they want to talk about it. In fact, one of my colleagues, who is not a Pacific Islander, says that indigenous knowledge is all superstition. So when you have one of your colleagues say that to you, you know that this is, you know, there's still many, many hurdles to confront. And the other one that I think many of you will probably experience, there's a shortage of mentors for our Pacifica students um, and a shortage of risk takers. My students know that when they talk about Kakala or the Vanua framework, they know they're taking a risk because you never know who is going to examine your PhD thesis. They might not have heard of Kakala. And this has happened uh, at USP. So it's, it's a huge risk. And so students don't want to take the risk. Who can blame them? Supervisors don't want to take the risk because of what their peers or other supervisors may think. So that's a huge ask. But um, I think it's, it's worth it. I hope that in Oceania, particularly in the Pacific Islands, Oceania will become a place where everyone, including academics, teachers, students, even politicians, and this is a big thing, not many politicians acknowledge the importance of traditional knowledge. Dr. Anna will tell you about that. Um, and value, value our cultural knowledge making it a part of our thinking as well as our doing in order that we can reclaim and re-emphasize our vital links to other people and their cultures, not to mention our link to the environment. If we were to separate people and environment, you go to indigenous traditional people to find that link where you don't cut a tree down unless you say certain things as a ritual and ask the god of the forest to forgive you for cutting down one of your cousins. Indigenous people, that's how they see their, work, their world. And it's very important now as we talk about sustainable development. It's my hope that those of us who work in island communities would encourage Pacific Islanders to look, look at everything, including sustainable uh, sustainable development from their um, indigenous and local worldview. And for many of us, this shift, this shift of moving away from business as usual 
is a risk, in, especially in this day and age of strategic plans, KPIs, quality assurance, and all other types of things that many of us sitting here have to comply with in our various institutions. But taking risks, I suggest, is needed if we are going to see some real and beneficial results of all the talking and the spending in the name of sustainable development, which is happening as I speak. Where is it, Bonn? That we are now encountering in the Pacific Islands, not only in our island environments, but in our institutions. So here's a poem about risk taking. Every day, do something that scares you, he said. Take risks, but don't forget to wear your sunscreen. So I took my laptop and deleted my past, saving only that which threatened to digest the dreams that dared to frighten a frail and divided heart. And in my attempt to recreate the moment, I found several scars left by unknown people I have loved in my mind and wondered what judgments or inconvenience I would cause if I was caught trying to, sorry, the, trying to escape from the fear of getting burnt, basking in a slice of sun. Malo Alpito. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I was asked to say a few words in response to Konai's address. Yesterday, Bob Tisdale brought his wife, Jenny, and introduced her to me. And when we started talking, uh, she asked about my grandchildren who are in Japan. And then in the process, she asked about Randy. And I suddenly realized she thought I was Konai. So I said, sorry, I am Anna. And she said, I was wondering why you've changed so much. And I thought, oh, you wondered how can I could become ugly since you last saw her. <laughs> but on all our behalfs, I'd like to thank Konai for her words of wisdom, and um, which have inspired me this morning. And it's unfortunate in a way that she is talking to the converted because her words resonate with our own beliefs and our own conceptualization of what sustainability means to us in the Pacific. And for those of us that she has reminded us, sustainability in the Pacific is a way of life. In one of our small islands in the Hapai group, for example, where root crops are very difficult to grow, and the main stable are bananas. You don't dream of cutting a whole bunch of bananas. You only pick one or two bananas a day. And while you feed your child a whole fish, you only give them one banana a day. So this is what sustainability means for us in the Pacific. So thank you, Konai, for the timely reminder to reclaim our own notions of sustainability for us in the Pacific in terms of our concepts, our knowledge, our understanding, and our practices as well. And listening to you, I realized how incoherent and confusing the whole area is. So what we need, the challenge for us, is to stop talking and start doing actions. Those of us who are in research, we need to broaden the base that we use so that we include the legislators, the policy makers, the curriculum developers, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that they understand what the whole thing is at risk for all our people. For example, we have a project on sustainable development in Tonga where children are encouraged to grow mangroves. So one primary school did, and then the next thing they knew, the prime minister ordered a golf course built in the area, bulldozed the whole thing, and is now a desert. So we need to bring coherency and action, purposeful action, 
so that we will achieve sustainable development in the long term in education for our children. Malo Alpito. ask a question it's now <laughs> nobody I? It's, this is Christine Fox. Thank you for acknowledging me at the beginning of your talk. This is just a comment. I have learned so much more from you than you could ever have learned from me. Thank you. Um, from your visits to our university in Auckland um, and the times you've spent with us. And when we discussed about a keynote speaker for this conference who has been very involved in the, at the global level as well as regional level, we, um, we knew you were the right person. Um, you think nothing has come out of the decade for of ESD, for e ESD. Do you have any hopes at all for Sustainable Development Goal 4 um, if we do not take heed of your advice? You know, given that it's a global agenda, is there any um, chance, do you think, of the world addressing the really um, huge problems inherent in sustainable development? Um, I think something came out of the decade, um, and that is the realization that we probably should change our approaches. Um, as the, the, con the conference in um, Japan found out, but I think if we don't shift our gaze with the SDGs and try to contextualize many of the goals to you know, to our context in the Pacific, I think we will still uh, face the same problems. Um, and it's, it's not an easy task because, as, as you know, there are just thousands of different languages and cultural groups in the Pacific to contextualize everything to suit um, them. But I think the, there are people who don't even realize that we need to contextualize. They're making a lot of assumptions. And I know, sitting in the UNESCO meetings, the kinds of assumptions that we make um, about other, other people, other countries, other cultures. It's, uh, you have to recognize that all cultures are equal, that some cultures are not um, superior than others, and that things that work in some communities will not work, no matter what, in other communities. And sometimes when I say these things, you know, people look at me as if, what are you talking about? That's your job to contextualize. And so it's, it's important that, you know, just because I come from the Pacific, it doesn't mean I know how to contextualize in Vanuatu or Solomon Islands, but I do have students from there, I have colleagues from there. So you go to them and they become, you know, they, they will teach you a few things. Um, but I think this, the whole notion of assuming that, you know, you have the knowledge and other people will be, quote, developed is uh, it's a very dangerous thing. And this is what the development community has been making all these years. And they're still making that. And not only that, our own people are making those assumptions. So it is a, a very difficult thing. But I think we can 
um, we can try, we can try to better contextualize. I know from my own experience working at USP, the, you know, a lot of people look at the students and I think, oh, this, they're just going to fail because they're lazy and this is our, these are teachers, our staff, and they're not really interested in, in changing their approach. And it is getting worse now with the push, certainly in my university, for e-learning. By the end of next year, the vice chancellor expects all courses at my university to be online. Okay? Now, that's his definition, or part of his definition for excellence. Excellence, right? Accreditation of our programs by overseas universities and moving towards online learning. So there are implications, huge implications for that. It's not sustainable in many parts of the Pacific to learn online. You have to have internet before it. Even if you live in the main towns, the internet is, you know, you don't get internet. It's not fast. And students, my students complain to me. I have a blended approach. I refuse to give up the face-to-face -face aspect of my teaching. But if you don't put your courses online by the end of next year, I don't know. You might not get your increment. You may not get promoted. You may not get your contract renewed. So these are constraints. And even though we know that we have to contextualize our work in the Pacific, some countries more than others, it's really, really difficult. So my hope really is to be able to have leaders in the now or in the future that can appreciate the need for that because it's really a waste of time. It's a waste of money, you know, for our development partners. It's a waste of money. They come and give us huge amounts of money. We have a big project. We go out there and run endless workshops. And then we write all these reports as to, you know, how the project went. Then you go there after the project and these people are still doing what they've always been doing. So I think we do need to better contextualize and especially the SDGs, huge amounts of money coming from everywhere. Climate change, SDG, the number. Now people in government have memorized the, the different 17 goals. I don't remember all of them. But they now tell me, what about SDG 4? And I thought, what? What about SDG 13? They know, they know. Yeah, yeah. 179. So we couldn't do it with MDGs with eight goals. Now we have 17 goals. So I think some of the papers will, will uh, talk about that, the individual goals. Thank you, Evie. Good morning. I really thank you for your speech because it was a really truly speech. You you said uh, um, yeah, you said your truth and not um, something um, like in. <laughs> Sorry, it's difficult. Um, so I will go to my question. I was wondering about. Uh, we heard about um, a kind of new pillar would be the good governance about sustainable development. And I was wondering about what is your vision about this democratic pillar? Is it a way to have a hope, that is to say a way to introduce different ways to SD, for example, Oceanian ways to SD, or is it only um, something? En français, quelqu'un qui traduit pour moi. Oui, merci. On a entendu parler d'un cinquième pilier qui serait le pilier de la bonne gouvernance. Est-ce que, selon vous, c'est une manière de diversifier les approches en vue du développement durable et de promouvoir des des dynamiques locales, ou est-ce qu'au contraire, ce n'est qu'une espèce de, de 
vernis qui est posé sur ce développement durable pour lui donner un peu plus de, oui, de consistance. Merci. Merci. Je prends. Je... Um, the understanding I have is that there is, um, is this a way of thinking for the oceanic way of thinking for research, development and governance? So was there a sense of governance, good governance for, for these ideas or... Is it just for if you have the, the right um, uh, conscience to, to sort of to think about these things, but how do you then do? So how do we make it something that is more maybe tangible, possibly, or is it just an idea in our own consciousness or in our own personal? Is for the individual, n'est-ce pas? Seulement pour le individual or pour le politique or the political consciousness to do this? C'est ça. Okay, my interpretation is that she wants to know how these kind of things I was talking about could be um, related to good governance, the importance of good governance, which is a lot of what, um, some of that relates to what Anna is saying. We can talk about this until we are blue in the face, but until we convince the people who govern us, like the politicians or the government, um, and make it part of their consciousness, it is part of our consciousness, um, that perhaps we, you know, we may not be able to get anywhere. So I, I see good governance, as you're suggesting, it, perhaps it might be an important pillar of sustainable development. Yes, yes. I think, um, you, again, sustainable development with economy, environment, and society and good governance, good governance may be a cross-cutting, what some people call a cross-cutting um, phenomena among all those things. And, and I think one of the challenges, you're quite right, that um, we face in terms of trying to shift uh, from business as usual is the lack of political will. And mm -hmm. she gave you an example of that where uh, and, of course, in the Pacific, we have not only individuals who have their own ideas in government of what should or shouldn't be done. We also have governments where, uh, you know, they, the, the, the ministers change. So, you know, you have a meeting, the minister comes to a meeting, and then the next one, next month, the ministers have changed because they've had a reshuffle. But, you know, this is what happens when we mimic what people in Europe do, or people in Britain do, and so we set up a government, a governance system that is based on that. And we don't have some of the, I don't know, ingredients, I suppose, to what they originally had in developing that system. So we, we face those kinds of problems. But good governance, whatever that means in terms of a, a particular community is certainly an important um, cross-cutting theme, if you like. Just uh, some people even suggested to UNESCO that culture should be a pillar. Uh, I argued against that because culture, to me, is either cross-cutting or all-embracing, uh, from, particularly from the Pacific. Um, so, um, yes, I, I agree with you in terms of the importance of governance um, and uh, whether we are successful in moving SDGs forward. Let's see. It will be the last question. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much, Conor, for your insightful contribution. Um, and as an Australian, it's one of the things that I think is significant about the Sustainable Development Goals, which is different from the Millennium Development Goals, is that they apply to all countries in the world. And that, unfortunately, some countries, including my own, I think, haven't quite realised this yet um, and don't realise that Australia and New Zealand, you know, and France are going to be called 
to account for how they are performing on the sustainable development goals. And actually some of them are doing quite badly on many of the ones that the Pacific will probably do well on. Um, and I'm reminded about the Pacific Islands leadership on the issue of uh, climate change, for example, you know, going on right now, I think, isn't there a conference? There, there are uh, Pacific representatives trying hard to convince the Australian government, for example, to do the right thing. And, and given you, the, your discussion about the, the, the ways in which Pacific Islanders have for millennia, I suppose, in a sense, practised sustainable development, do you see avenues for Pacific Islands uh, influencing um, other countries in the region like Australia and New Zealand on the whole thing? I mean, I'm thinking about things like, like renewable energy as well. The one that Australia will do worst on and will have difficulty is life on the land, which is because of the, the deforestation but then some other countries in the Pacific and aren't doing too well on the deforestation goal either. So I'm just wondering if you see avenues and, and, and mechanisms for, uh, you know, the, the island countries in the region to be able to uh, influence the big powers a bit. Um, thank you, Helen. You're quite right in terms of the SDGs uh, applying to everybody. Um, I think in the Pacific Islands where we, a lot of us think of sustainable development in terms of relationships, you know, cultural survival, importance of human relationships and particularly social responsibility. Maybe we can get together and develop a, a social security index that we can judge Australia and the US and China and uh, other countries. Um, that would be interesting. <laughs> I think it can be done. Um, but there are certain areas, I think, that we, we can make a, an important contribution to the, to the global agenda on sustainable development. Unfortunately, um, as I said, many of us are still thinking about sustainable development in terms of what we read in the literature rather than saying, well, what does that mean for us? How do we see sustainable development? Um, COP 2, two 3, Interesting, uh, uh, Bainimarama is there, and we have lots and lots of Pacific Islanders there. And uh, when you look at who is there from the Pacific Islands, they're mainly people from the environment departments. And we have environment departments throughout the Pacific with all kinds of rules and regulations about a clean environment, about pollution, about anything, but they don't follow up many of these things. So we go to the market and they're still selling these tiny crabs when you, that's not allowed and nobody's doing anything about it. So um, I think that we need to, <laughs> to have not only laws, when you have the, the rule and the law passed in parliament about environmental protection, you have to make sure that people comply. Otherwise it's, it's just like, a strategic plan. We, we do one for this year and then another one for next year and we don't really care what happened last year when we're doing the ones for next year. So I, I agree with you that there are some things that perhaps we can take a lead role in that because um, it comes naturally perhaps as part of our traditional knowledge but um, we do need to make sure that, that the compliance aspect um, is looked at and do the follow-up. Eve knows about follow-up. <laughs> she was using that word many times this morning, but this, this is important if we want to uh, you know, get somewhere, the follow-up is important. Thank you very much. So I have five important information, but before the five points, I want to thank Konai and all the people that ask question and I think Everyone deserve a final applause. So, <laughs> so uh, the five information. The first one is to say sorry about the noise. The noise at the beginning of the keynote. So we made the noise. The noise stop. So after that, it was better. 
Second, sorry again for the bus delay this morning. So, um, well, bus and buses and timetable are quite a problem in New Caledonia, but we hope tomorrow everything will be fine and without a new delay. So, please, sorry for today. Uh, the third information is that uh, we're going to move now to the School of Education. So at the School of Education, you will find uh, bottles of water uh, for you if you are thirsty. Uh, please note that when you got your bottle, you can refill it with uh, water fountains. We have two water fountains at the School of Education. So please, when you have your bottle, when the bottle is empty, you can refill it with the water fountains. Uh, for um, some uh, people uh, told me about problems at UNC residence with the water in the showers. So if you think your water is too hot or not so hot, if you have a problem, please tell me which is, what is the number of your apartment and we'll try to fix the problem for tonight. And uh, the final information is that we will Exit by this door, please, everybody, exit by this door. You've got here two uh, helps to go with you, to guide you to the School of Education. It's a three-minute walk, so you follow them, and there will be no problem. Thank you again, and thank you, Kunai, for your keynote. It was wonderful. Thank you.